My name is Carly Strauss, and for the past year, I've served on the consulting team at Third Plateau running the coalition's day-to-day um, -day operations. On behalf of the Safety Respect Equity Coalition's leadership, I wanna thank all of you for being here and making the time for this webinar on pay equity. This webinar is part of a series that we're doing that's going to focus more deeply on various elements of the Safety Respect Equity Coalition standards. And I wanna say a huge thank you to our two speakers today, Rabbi Mary Zamor and Morty Walfish. Um, they both have been great allies to the coalition and committed their time and passion and efforts to this work over the past 18 months that we've been around. Before we begin, I just wanna start us with a few housekeeping items. Just wanna make sure you all are aware that we are recording this session. Slides in the recording will be available online next week. Um, we do recognize that it's important to keep these sessions interactive. There will be plenty of time for questions at the end, but for those of you who are not currently speaking, if you can just keep yourselves on mute, that helps a lot with our sound quality. Um, and last thing, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, you can either ask them to everyone if you're okay with it public, being public, or if you want to ask um, anonymously, feel free to chat them directly to me. Um, so that's sort of the housekeeping. Um, if you've got any questions, throw them in the chat. I also just wanted to share a few words on the coalition's path to this point before I turn it over to Mary and Morty. As many of you are familiar with, um, the Safety Respect Equity Coalition is a group of over 100 Jewish organizations across the country and as it's rapidly growing across the world who have come together to reduce um, sexual harassment and gender discrimination in our community. Our organ member organizations are spread coast to coast and very greatly in size and type. We've got everything from big organizations and movements, funders, JCCs, individual congregations, Jewish service, service agencies, and all other types. Um, and the coalition's goal is to bring all of this great work in the areas of preventing sexual harassment and gender discrimination together under one banner. We're here to serve as a catalyst, a convener, a clearinghouse, to lift up the great work that's already happening and support new solutions in the areas where our members are finding challenges. Our goal is threefold, universal leadership commitment, organizational change, and culture shift across the entire Jewish communal world. We're so grateful to have you all on this journey with us. And today I'm excited to introduce two experts who will lead us in conversation about pay equity in the Jewish community, why it matters and how your organization can develop an equitable compensation philosophy. Morty Walfish is the Chief Operating Officer at Leading Edge, where he oversees his operations with a particular focus on supporting leaders to build Jewish organizations that are great places to work. Rabbi Mary Zamor is the Executive Director of the Women's Rabbinic Network, which supports Reform Women Rabbis advocating for equity for all. She is the co-leader of the Reform Pay Equity Initiative and has the Women's Rabbinic Network's Clergy, Safe Employees, and Employers Program both of which are funded by the SRE Coalition. She's also the editor of The Sacred Exchange, creating a Jewish money ethic from the CCAR Press this year. So Mary and Morty, thank you both so much for being here and take it away. Thank you. I'm gonna start with some words of Tara. Of course, our universal moral imperative guides this work, but our specific Jewish commandments and uh, texts also give us a lot of fuel for our, our seeking justice in the world. Some of the most fundamental uh, values that come to us, of course, are from the foundational commandment and understanding that we're all B'Tselem Elohim, that we're all made in God's image. No one person is better than another because of this idea of understanding of how we're created. Then there are other texts that inform us uh, texts that tell us that in matters of judgment and justice, that the rich and the poor neither shall be favored in any particular way, but everybody judged equally. We're told that there needs to be justice and fairness within the marketplace. And we have so many uh, laws, both in the Torah and also in the expanded text that teach us that both sellers and consumers need to be treated fairly, not one favored over the other as well. But now we're going to look at the text. So here, uh, this is among my favorite texts when we're talking about pay equity. And it's really a text that has to do with the marketplace. And understanding that the marketplace, of course, uh, was uh, not like today with the online sellers and all sorts of malls, 
but rather uh, cottage industry and uh, market days when people would gather in town centers. But it is as uh, vital and pertinent as ever. So, Motasu Evo Bamishpat, Bamida, Bamishkal, Uv Misura. So, here you shall not falsify measures of um, length, weight, or capacity, different types of measurements. And here it goes on in the next pasuk, in the next verse, to say, You shall have an honest balance. And uh, this refrain of honest in Hebrew, it's tzedek, um, which also has to do with justice uh, and being fair. So, honest balance, honest weights. Anas Efa, dry measure, Anas Hina, a liquid measure. I am Adonai, your God, who freed you from the land of Egypt. We're going to go to the next slide, and here, using the Steinsaltz translation, uh, we see the commentary that if somebody has not had honesty in their measures in the marketplace, whether it's home based or, or in the public space, uh, that there's, uh, if one does this, there's no possibility of repentance because the, the seller has no way of knowing whom he has cheated and therefore unable to return the stolen money. Lo ev sharbachuba, absolutely no possibility of repentance, making amends, finding out who's been cheated and making it right. That's a really powerful statement. This is among some others on the same page of Talmud talking about other comparisons, about how good or bad um, this type of, well, never good, but how bad on the spectrum of doing wrong uh, this type of sin is. So when we apply this to the modern workplace, we not only have the commodities as we have here in the measuring, but we also, of course, have employees. And I'm inspired to see that when we hire people within the marketplace, when we decide what their compensation is, their advancement, we are in fact weighing and measuring them. We have in fact scales that by which we make these decisions. Some of them are honest and some of them are unfortunately uh, fueled by implicit bias and other types of biases and prejudices and therefore they are not fully calibrated appropriately, not with the sense of tzedek, justice. And so with the next slide, we'll see that the idea that we're robbing people is very much true. Here we have a graphic from the National Women's Law Center showing us the uh, amount of money that women lose to the wage gap over a 40 year career. But it is not just uh, the money in the bank account. It is also, as the Talmud teaches us, this impossibility to really measure how much is stolen because it's the immediate money. It's also the impact on the individual, the family, the community. It is um, a stealing of dignity. It is a stealing of aspiration and inspiration in the workplace and all the things that each individual should be able to gain through employment. And so we, we understand that when the scales of equity, pay equity are not equal, that lo ev sharbachuba, that it is impossible truly to make that up to the employee as she has been robbed. And so we dig in today to learn more about the structural changes we need to make to create equity, uh, to eliminate gender harassment, and really ultimately issues of a wage gap, uh, the pay inequities are really the financial dimension of gender harassment. Morty, I know you have uh, some foundational teachings for uh, uh, pay equity for us. Thank you so much, Mary, and thanks so much for grounding our work um, in, in our Jewish text and tradition. Uh, so as Mary shared, we're really gonna do three things for you today. We're gonna share some about the national landscape around pay equity. We're gonna share a little bit about pay equity um, currently in the Jewish nonprofit sector. And then we're really gonna do a zoom in on one of the major initiatives to address pay equity in our Jewish community, uh, which is the effort that Mary's been leading um, at the Reform Pay Equity Initiative. Um, so Carly, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we just wanted to start off by really locating the issue of pay equity in the broader framework of the goals 
and values of the Safety Respect Equity Coalition. So we have here really the four um, core values um, of this coalition. And we've highlighted what we think are kind of the role that pay equity really plays in here. So the first is really recognizing that no community, including our own, is immune from sex and gender-based bias and misconduct. And we really say, we really see the pay inequity that exists today as a form of sex and gender-based bias. Second, the coalition is really striving to foster organizational and communal cultures where all individuals have equal opportunities for hiring and advancement as professionals and volunteers. And we know that so much about our values gets articulated in how people are paid. And so in order to have a culture of equality, we also need to have, um, we need to have pay equity. We need to believe that transparency and accountability are essential elements of healthy organizations and communities. And we'll talk a little bit later about the role that transparency really plays in pay equity. And finally, the coalition is seeking to affect change at the leadership, organizational, and community-wide levels to do everything possible to guarantee that all Jewish workplaces and communal spaces are safe, respectful, and equitable for all. And really for us, pay equity is a key component of this. And we can go to the next slide. We also want to start off just by highlighting a couple of the key terms um, really to ground us in this conversation today. And two in particular that I wanted to just call out here. And the first is really pay parity. And this is the idea that employers should show no pay gap across the entire workforce between men and women and people of other genders, between uh, based, based on your racial identity and based on other protected categories. But we're, what we're gonna be talking about today is really pay equity, which is paying employees fairly and consistently without discrimination on the basis of gender, race, or other protected categories. But that does take into account job-related factors such as education, work experience, and tenure. And so I hope that key difference there really helps also locate our conversation today. Um, and next slide. So in 2015, um, Leading Edge conducted a pretty extensive literature review um, on um, organizational culture writ large. And we really identified five components of what we see to be a healthy workplace culture and what we define at Leading Edge as a leading place to work. And you'll see the five components um, laid out for you here today. The first is really trusted leadership, the idea that the leader at the helm of the organization must have the trust of their people, and really that their inside face matches their outside face, and that they are living out the values of the organization. The second is a common purpose, this idea that a leading place to work should have a clear vision and core values that are regularly communicated both internally to staff and externally to communities that are served. The third is respected employees, really this idea that employees should be res respected deeply from the beginning of the hiring process through onboarding and training and in every single interaction that happens throughout the workplace. Uh, the fourth is talent development, the recognition that professionals really crave opportunities to advance their knowledge, their skill sets and their abilities, and that a leading place to work really offers those opportunities. And finally, which really is at the heart of our subject today, which is around salary and benefits. We really believe that to be a leading place to work, organizations need to have clear compensation philosophies and methodologies that inform the roles and responsibilities of their teams. Um, it is important to note that nonprofits often feel constrained in this area due to tight budgets. Uh, but we really believe that leading places to work can find equitable, flexible, and creative ways to really establish and clearly communicate their compensation philosophy. Next slide. As many of you know, Leading Edge conducts an annual employee experience survey. This year we surveyed 182 different Jewish organizations, primarily to provide them with a tool to really understand how their culture is operating and to think about ways to really build on existing culture to improve that. And this also enables Leading Edge to collect field-wide data. And I wanted to just share kind of a few stats from this past year's survey in 2019 that really directly relate to salary and benefits. Um, you'll see here 43% of employees across the sector believe that their total compensation is fair relative to similar roles at their organization. And we'll see here a pretty major gender gap, women at 42%, men at 55%. Only 38% uh, of employees that we surveyed, this is over 11,000 employees, understand how salary decisions and raises happen at their organization. And again, we see a pretty significant gender gap of 10% between our, our female and male respondents. And 35% believe that their total compensation is fair relative to similar roles at other organizations. 
So this is, of course, all self-reported, but what we really see here is that setting and communicating compensation um, is really a common pain point for, for managers. And employees who identify as male appear to have a cl much clearer understanding of how their compensation is set. Next slide. Just to share a little bit more data, um, this is just a different way of visualizing that and also brings into uh, it brings into bear this idea of psychological safety. Who is comfortable speaking up in the workplace? And here we also see a fairly significant gap between the men and the women. And for us, these issues are all really tied together. Next slide. We also wanted to share just a little bit about the national landscape that Mary gestured towards around pay equity. Um, and what really the research and our experience shows is that the wage gap is an open secret. Everyone knows that it exists across industries. And at the same time, people often locate the challenge, um, especially around the gender pay gap in women. This idea that you know women just need to negotiate more or play the game. And that's really not our approach here. We believe that the system is itself broken and that we need to create equity around pay from a systemic level. Um, just to share some, some data points here, um, the standard uh, the standard data really shows that women working full-time in the U.S. are today paid typically about 80% of what men are paid. Um, and according to the American Association for University Women, if we continue at the current rate of narrowing that gap, uh, we will not achieve equal pay until 2059. Um, and it's important here, as you see in this slide, also to recognize that there is a racial dimension at play here. So for every one dollar that a white man makes, the data shows that Asian women make 94 cents on the dollar, white women 82 cents on the dollar, African American women 68 cents on the dollar, and Hispanic women 61 cents on the dollar. Next slide. I wanted to also just share some of the national initiatives that really exist to address pay equity. Um, so in 1963, the Equal Pay Act was introduced, um, prohibiting gender-based wage discrimination in the United States. Um, it was signed into effect by President Kennedy um, as an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, and the law really mandates equal pay for equal work, and it forbids employers from paying men and women different wages or benefits for doing jobs that require the same skills and responsibilities. And this bill was really among the first laws in American history aimed at reducing gender discrimination in the workplace. So what does that actually mean in practice? It basically means that employees who believe that they are being discriminated against from a pay perspective, they can either file a complaint with the EEOC or they can directly sue their employer in court. Um, and the research really shows that combined with increased education and career opportunities for women, these regulations um, have helped slightly narrow the gender gap in the US. Um, and nevertheless, as I shared earlier, women are still being paid significantly less than men on average. Um, I'm not sure folks have heard of Equal Pay Day, but this was um, an initiative originated in, I believe, 1996 by the National Committee on Pay Equity, um, really as a public awareness event to illustrate the gap between men's and women's wages. I want to share just a few examples of how other industries are addressing pay equity. And these are actually drawn from this article by Shifra Bronznik um, and her daughter, Emma Goldberg, um, in this, uh, this piece that I think Mary's gonna refer to later. Uh, but the piece really shares um, a few different initiatives that are worthwhile for us to think about. Uh, one is how in Iceland, the government passed a law recently demanding employers to demonstrate that they pay women and men equally, and that if they fail to do so, they must explain why. Um, another law that's um, back um, domestically that's really important to mention is that many states, um, including New York recently, um, now have laws that prohibit employers from relying on prior salary history for setting compensation. And really that was seen as really a long held practice that enabled um, employers to essentially legally pay women or at least pay women for, uh, pay women less for the same work because it was based on prior inequitable salaries. At the same time, uh, these days are also some grassroots industry specific efforts. Uh, for example, recently museum employees around the country have started sharing compensation data with one another. Um, there's all sorts of efforts really to, to really open the black box um, around compensation. And next slide. Speaking of black box, um, something that we've really seen in our work is that overall in the Jewish nonprofit sector, compensation tends to be a black box. 
Uh, while CEO salaries, along with other highly compensated individuals, are reported on 990s. Uh, beyond that, there's really little transparency around how compensation happens, how decisions are made um, in the Jewish nonprofit sector. Um, anecdotally, we do know that there is a major gender pay gap at all levels in the Jewish nonprofit sector. Uh, many people are familiar with the, for, the, the forward salary survey, which really gestures towards this, although it only focuses on certain um, CEOs in our sector, but there's definitely a major gap there as well. Um, well we also know that there's a tremendous pay gap um, in our sector between those at the executive and those at the non-executive level, with CEOs often making you know, 10 times that of entry-level staff. Um, and I'll share that increasingly organizations are really realizing the major value of compensation benchmarking and are either producing their own internal analyses. Um, the Orthodox Union, for example, has done that. Hill International does that. Um, and so many folks are now really asking us for a field-wide analysis. So one of the few field-wide initiatives that actually currently exists is the Reform Pay Equity Initiative. And I'm going to invite Mary to really do a deep dive into that work. And I think you're still on mute. Let's see, is that better? Yes, thank you, Morty. Um, so um, we're gonna continue to the next slide and uh, take a deep look into the mirror. The reform movement, of course, um, as you know, it embraces all of these Jewish values of social justice. And uh, we're among the loudest voices when it has to do with um, advocating in the public space for the laws and policies that will support pay equity. And we've been doing so since uh, the early 60s, 1960s. And even by the 1980s and some of the resolutions of the reform movement, we saw a recognition that women Jewish professionals were not being paid equally within the reform movement. But unfortunately, there's been no uh, effort to really address this systemically within the reform movement and to hold up that mirror. That mirror, as Morty has already pointed out to us, uh, and SRE, of course, also uh, challenges the Jewish community, we are just a mirror to the secular workplace. But it is easy to really think that we're immune. Uh, as Jews, that we uphold these important values, we hear the command of Torah and our sacred texts, and to believe that we are immune from all of this. But unfortunately, we're not. So uh, Women's Rabbinic Network, um, over four years ago, uh, started to talk to all of our partner organizations on the, under the reform umbrella. And there are 17 organizations that affiliate with the reform movement. Um, and to start to talk about the pay gap that exists for all uh, Jew Jewish uh, professionals within the reform movement. It was important as an organization, uh, even though we focus on support and advocacy for women rabbis of the reform movement, that whatever we did would really help everybody within the movement and beyond. So uh, early in our work, we were approached by the Women of Reform Judaism and my partner, uh, Rabbi Marla Feldman, who's their executive director, saying that they wanted to be even a more active partner. So we have joined uh, forces and Rabbi Feldman and myself have been co-leading what is now known as the Reform Pay Equity Initiative. So we hope that this is uh, not only making a difference within our own movement, but creates a model for all. So the two things that we really is informing all of our work is that whatever happens has to help, help has to help all the different variety of Jewish professionals within our institutions and our congregations, and that everything has to be outward facing so that others can make use of it, not only uh, within the Jewish world, but even beyond. So that, for instance, our congregants can even look at these materials and help them and support them in their secular workplaces, or another movement outside of Judaism could, uh, religious movement could make use of them. And so we use all of these Jewish uh, values to inform our work. And uh, here we're going to go to the next slide um, and see what the reality is within the reform movement. 
if you remember Morty's slide, and, and Morty, that's about the most optimistic um, measure of the pay gap within, uh, you know, secular, the secular world that uh, we have, uh, you know, within a couple of cents, uh, different surveys show different um, uh, renditions of that, so pretty much on par. And here we can see that our executive directors and administrators um, have a pay gap of around 19 cents. Uh, that canters within the reform movement have a penalty ranging on the type of congregation they're serving, the size, uh, 14 to 29. You can do that as a percentage or see that as a cents per dollar, either way. For rabbis, the penalty ranges from four to 13 cents. Uh, but when you adjust for title and size, meaning that uh, when you look at the data, and this is uh, often true for other types of Jewish professionals, that we see uh, a greater percentage of men in the largest size congregations in the most senior positions, um, and the women, unfortunately, are more congregated among the assistantships the solo pulpit rabbis in the smallest size congregations. And that's often where the a large gap can exist. Our data is drawn from two different types of uh, sources. One is the CCAR URJ salary study. This is our gold standard because it's administrative data. It's drawn uh, from the fact that most uh, CCR rabbis pay into the same pension fund, the Reform Pension Board, and uh, we're able with their, um, with their guidance to get an ability to get that data. Uh, the CCR has done some wonderful studies with that, now two of them, and, um, and be able to strip the names and only look at the uh, um, anonymous data to see this. The other groups do uh, salary surveys. Um, and, uh, but the results are about the same. So we, we feel that they're very solid. We've also hired an economist, uh, Lee Gould, uh, to work with us and to look at the different types of data and to aggregate it so that we understand how it all functions together. So we're just gonna take a quick look at two graphics to give you peruse who's actually in the Reform Pay Equity Initiative. Here's our whole alphabet soup of, of people involved uh, and we, Part of being in the initiative is asking each one of these groups to reflect within their organization and also then to see the places with, in which they can affect change. Obviously, the ones that can affect the most change, of course, are going to be the URJ itself, the Union for Reform Judaism, representing the congregations and uh, being one of the largest employers with summer camps. Uh, you know, we're talking about thousands of people being employed by the URJ itself. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, our professional uh, groups. So that includes the ACC, the Cantors, um, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the CCAR, the Early Child Educators of Reform Judaism, the ECERJ, um, the uh, National Association for Temple Administrators, NADA, um, all of these organizations oversee and interface with the URJ with placement issues. So that is one of those hubs for really affecting change. They've been all wonderful partners and doing wonderful work within their organizations where they can affect change and wonderful synergy among all these groups. Now you're gonna get a quick view of the graphics just so you can see our, our fancy logos. Very pretty, we're gonna now move forward. <laughs> And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the interventions that we have been doing. So we, have, of course, have a continued emphasis on data collection. Uh, through uh, the Reform um, uh, uh, Pay Equity Initiative, we have been uh, really urging the, um, synch to synchronize when data is collected so that when we aggregate the data, it comes from uh, within a year or two of each other's collection. Uh, to up the frequency so that hopefully it's every two to three years, depending on what the different groups have the ability to do. Uh, to up the quality of data collection by working with uh, the economists that we've been able to make available to everybody. And uh, to have the synergy not only with data collection, but all sorts of open communication about placement and other measures we're trying to bake into the systems of placement to affect change. 
We have, of course, trying to really just the way Equal Pay do Day does, we've been trying to educate our entire movement that this is a problem within our movement. We've been trying to raise up the facts. We've been trying to raise up our Jewish values and to show the huge gap between what we believe and espouse, in fact, what we advocate for very actively in the world, but what really happens within our movement. And we've been trying to mix that with training. So we've been going to all of the different national conventions, whether it's the biennial where 5,000 reformed Jews gather, um, or the different professional organizations, online webinars and the such, to be able to uh, educate through two streams, focusing on employees, but also employers. And we're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Some of the things that have happened which have been extremely uh, impactful is uh, one of the results of this work has been uh, changes to the placement processes, raising up these issues within uh, the discussions of, of placement. The CCR itself, um, a year ago, has now, uh, with the um, uh, Commission on, um, on Placement, Rabbinic Placement, which is between the URJ and the CCAR, has instituted that salary ranges now must be stated on all placement uh, documents. Before, a congregation uh, could just say that they um, were commiserate with uh, market value, with experience, all sorts of different verbiage there, uh, but not actually put a salary range. When groups put the salary range in advance, it has a wonderful impact on reducing the wage gap. Uh, the CCR is also uh, now working to build an implicit bias training tool that would work with uh, search committees and they've committed to making this available to the other placement uh, groups so that uh, educators could take advantage of this. The uh, executive directors and the cantors, everybody could take advantage of this within our movement and perhaps beyond. So we're looking forward to that work as well. We've also built out a website, so we're going to look at that next in our next slide, reformpayequity.org. Again, this was our outward facing uh, value, and uh, we have two different streams. So I'm going to ask uh, Carly just to quickly toggle to the next slide. And here you can see it uh, up live. This is a screenshot, Reform Pay Equity Initiative. And this is just the top of it. Uh, you can, of course, in real life, scroll down and see the rest of our, our website. Uh, but one of the things I really wanted to make sure that you saw is these two buttons, employer, employee, that we've curated some of the material in, in uh, different paths so that if somebody is, uh, you know, leading a search committee, they can click employer and they can read through all those materials quickly and understand uh, some of the goals that they'll want to bring to that search process. If they're an employee, if, if you know, they're, they have an interview in two days and they want to prepare themselves, they've heard about the wage gap and they, they really want to go into their interview or, or a negotiation and, and be well girded with, with uh, information, uh, those resources are there. At the top, you see that there's home, um, there's teaching and preaching. We have a lot of different materials there. We have materials for Equal Pay Day. If people want to teach, preach, or sing around Equal Pay Day, uh, if they uh, want to do an adult ed uh, sessions or anything like that, we have many other resources drawn from many different sources. Uh, and then specifically, we want to highlight implicit bias because that's a particularly powerful tool in, um, in uh, fighting the wage gap. One of the things that we're really trying to emphasize is that within the Jewish professional world, uh, we all are employees, but we also are usually also employers. And this is uh, one of the strongest teachings we can all bring to this work in the reform movement and beyond. Because uh, most of us as nonprofit uh, professionals in the Jewish world, we will, uh, within sometimes a few months of being hired ourselves, be involved or be a stakeholder in somebody else's employment pro um, process, whether that's supervising other people or hiring other people. And so uh, a lot of our trainings are focused on, on this uh, point of, of leverage. So the more, uh, you know, people are often drawn to this because they are curious about the, about the wage gap 
and how it affects themselves. But we always emphasize over and over, you can learn this for yourself. We want this to help you in your particular situation. But we also want you to learn this from the employer side point of view. And whether you're a congregant, you're a volunteer, uh, you're an employee, we all are the employer as well. And so uh, that is one of our prime teachings. And we're also interfacing with the, with the Hebrew Union College and raising up these issues for Hebrew Union College. Uh, we go into the uh, seminary at the three different stateside campuses of New York, Cincinnati, and LA. And we've been doing um, interview and negotiation skills for women. It's open to all genders, but we do it with that particular lens. And we, we point out all the things that uh, women can do and employers can do uh, to minimize the wage gap. Um, and so we're hoping that the wherever we are in the Jewish world that we'll be able to um, have more and more trainings that focus on ourselves as employers and whether it's in our seminaries, our graduate programs, uh, that make sure that this professional development dimension is there and of course through our professional organizations. Um, one of the nice resources that we built out, next slide, is uh, we had the opportunity to partner with the CCAR. And, and uh, by the way, with the website, I want to mention that's being hosted by the URJ. They were um, amazingly generous and were able to uh, customize a website which is designed really for congregations uh, to make that come alive for us. And here's another example of wonderful partnership, the CCAR. Um, allowed us to have a published symposium on pay equity within the reform movement. And uh, it is outward facing. That is something that's not usually done with this scholarly journal. Uh, but it is all of the articles in the symposium are open with uh, just click on links and you can read everything in all 12 articles in the symposium. Uh, next slide, you'll see the actual uh, list of articles available. I'm not going to um, sit here and read every single uh, title to you and every author, but they are a wonderful reflection of a focus on text, a focus on, um, on the work of pay equity. Um, some of the salary surveys, the, uh, our economist wrote um, a report on her aggregation of all the data, um, looking beyond salaries to fair employment practices, and um, discussing all benefits and things like that, some case studies, and, um, and a wonderful article by Schiffer Pronsnick and Emma Goldberg, which uh, Morty referred to. Uh, one of the other things that we've been able to build out um, with these materials are now with Rabbi Helene Edinger, um, with helped us in writing study guides. These are all available on the CCR website with the uh, journal itself, or they can be found on the reformpayequity.org website. And we have three different versions of these study guides so that you can use them for board training, you can use them for a search committee training, and you can use them for adult learning in your congregation or institution. And the adult education learning is three sessions um, and the board and search committee are one or two. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, those teach and preach and sing resources for equal pay days and any other time you wanna highlight these issues. I want to just tell you uh, about some of the ongoing challenges we have in the next slide. Yes, and we have a question that absolutely the board training guides are available not just for congregations, but for any, any nonprofit uh, Jewish institution that would like to use them. Thank you, Adit. Um, so now we're going to go to the next slide, which is uh, challenges. And here um, we recognize that the data we do have is limited. We are not a um, huge um, corporation that has factories and factories with people in very similar stripes and, and whatnot making widgets. Um, the data we have among the different professional groups are mostly congregational. And uh, depending on the group, uh, for instance, in rabbinic, uh, it's all congregational, it's all full time. When you look at cantorial uh, administrators, educators, there is some more variety there, but the uh, data is limited. 
um, the problem of what I like to call unicorns. Uh, meaning that within the Jewish nonprofit professional world, as we all know, there are many organizations, there are many institutions, and there are many positions which seem extremely unique. And as I recognize that, I'm also going to say a very um, strong uh, words to our community. If you are able to list a position and set a compensation package to it, uh, then I really think it behooves us and that we have the capacity to also look at that compensation package and to try to use a gender lens to see whether or not we're perpetuating a wage gap. Very often we hear from people that this position is so unique that we have no one to compare it to. Well, that obviously is not true. If you're able to set compensation and benefits in any way, shape, or form, you have mentally in some way compared them to somebody. So I would urge everyone to figure out how to see our unicorns as regular livestock and not so unique, um, and to actually do some of that comparison. Our other challenges have been engaging individual congregations. Strangely enough, nobody really wants to raise their hand either as a congregation or institution and say, you know what, you're right, we're the ones perpetuating a wage gap. Um, so we find the best way is to educate in general, uh, to work with the professional organizations and with the URJ and to make changes into the systems of placement and to work with Hebrew Union College to educate colleagues on the employee and employer side. But we still will continue to work to educate our individual over 900 congregations in the reform movement to be able to affect change for over 1.9 million people. I also want to recognize that we right now we're only focusing on Jewish professionals. There are many, many people who serve reform institutions and reform congregations who are non-professional employees. And so it is important to us that we both recognize that and we continue to raise consciousness and education and tools that are beyond our professional staffs. I also want to recognize that there are some professions which are greatly influenced by being a gender segregated profession, meaning that all, almost all or just a huge percentage of the professionals are of one gender. So our early childhood educators, this is a huge challenge when we talk about pay equity. Um, education in general is highly um, populated by women, especially uh, on the teacher level classroom teacher level. Um, and so, for instance, a con large congregation really spoke, recently spoke to me because their senior rabbi in studying our materials realized that their ECE teachers who were there daily creating the next generation of citizens and Jews uh, were being paid much, much less when they compared that hourly rate to their after school religious school teachers. And that's something that they are now trying to address and think about. Uh, so there are ways around that challenge, but it is a challenge. Next slide. I want to share just two last thoughts before I throw this back to Morty. Copy us, please. As I said, uh, all of this is outward facing. Uh, there's very little here that uh, is so specific to the reform movement that it can't be shared and worked with in other uh, streams of Judaism, whether it's nonprofit world, organizational world, um, other, other streams of Judaism. Um, really, it's all there for the taking. So please copy us. And finally, I'm going to end with these words from my uh, friend and a wonderful ally, Michael Gann. Um, Michael is an employment lawyer and has uh, really early on been working on pay equity issues. Um, he says, there are so many problems in the, world, in the world that we can't fix. This is one we can fix. It's within our control. So those days when we feel like there's nothing we can do, this is something we can do. Thank you, Mary. Could not agree more. Um, next slide, please, Carly. 
Um, in that vein, um, I just wanted to share as we close um, two things that every organization can really do to help address the pay, the pay gap. Uh, the first is what we call a gender pay audit, and it is really a mechanism to examine pay based on job, job categories and experience and discover whether or not there are any inequities that might exist. Um, there are lots of resources out there for how to do that. I'm not going to go in depth with that here, but that's really an essential, um, it's an essential piece of that process. The second one, which is much more forward looking, is really to develop um, a compensation philosophy with an equity lens. And that's what really something that we are encouraging all employers to do. Um, because um, throughout our research at Leading Edge, we found that the majority of employ employees in our sector do not understand how compensation is set. Um, we really feel it's important for there to be core principles and processes that are articulated and transparent around compensation. Um, and we just want to share, I just want to share just a few key steps to bringing um, a compensation philosophy to life. And the first one really is um, to establish core values and guiding principles. Um, we believe that in order to optimize success and also build positive staff morale, um, an organization's compensation philosophy really must be driven by values from start to finish. Um, some of the values that really come to mind for us are around transparency about the process so that salaries are not set in a really arbitrary way. Um, consistency, fairness, and equity, ensuring that all staff members are treated fairly and equally with regard to compensation and their understanding of compensation. And that really means that every employee, no matter their level of leadership, type of role, or length of time in an organization, should have access to the same information about how compensation is determined and rewarded um, at their organization. And also really um, to have proactive communication about this. Uh, we encourage employers not to wait for grumblings or skepticism to brew before sharing information um, about your organization's compensation philosophy. The second piece here is really to create your compensation ecosystem and it can include a number of different components beyond individual salary, which is obviously the biggest and most important. Um, but that should include you know, a benefits package, um, including parental leave and flex time, vacation time, bonuses and supplemental incentive pay, promotion opportunities, professional development. This is all part of the compensation ecosystem and what um, employers provide to their employees. The third piece, of course, is putting the compensation philosophy into practice. Um, as, as Mary shared, some of the practices that uh, their initiative is encouraging, we strongly believe in, sharing information about benefits and salary and job postings, recruitment materials on the website. Um, it's super essential here, including details about um, your organization's compensation philosophy in the onboarding process for all employees. Um, implementing a consistent and robust performance evaluation system, communicating clearly and consistently about when employees may receive raises or salary adjustments, things like that. And finally, it's, it's important just to be aware of some of the common pitfalls here. Um, we often find, at least anecdotally, that sometimes uh, pay inequity arises from employees who present themselves as flight risks. Um, and what we try to encourage organizations to do is not to necessarily reward employees who present themselves as flight risk while taking, you know, loyal, high performing employees for granted. For us, really, the most important thing is really to implement a consistent process for how employees can really apply for promotions and for and for pay raises. Uh, we also encourage organizations not to ignore employees perceptions of unfairness, really to ask questions to better understand when employees are feeling frustrated and skeptical about how they're being compensated, because we know that a lot of organizations, we have a lot of work to do around this. I think that's all we got. We only have a few minutes for questions, but I think both Mary and I um, are very open to taking them. Yep, and Morty, I've got one that was chatted directly to me that I can kick us off with. Great. Um, somebody asked if you can comment on the differences between perceptions of equity within organizations versus equity across similar organizations. Sure, I mean, it's, perception is tricky because, right, it's about an individual's experience. Um, I think, and I, I feel like Mary really got to this point when talking about uh, this, um, this image of the unicorn and this perception of uniqueness. I think oftentimes organizations have some different job titles than each other. 
Um, and that can often be used as a way to either hold people back from a pay perspective. And so um, for us, I think we're always looking at um, creating consistency both internally and externally. And I think as Mary shared, to look at ways in which um, comparables are really possible. And I just wanted to, to add, when it's not possible to do a broad data study of compensation, um, I encourage people to do their own micro uh, collection of data. And that can go across organizations or beyond, where you really try to pinpoint what the actual responsibilities are and have true conversations with colleagues. I have like four to 10 colleagues who have something similar so that you start to break down those boundaries and really see what people are doing beyond the, the uh, disparate titles. Great, thank you both so much. Um, for all of our participants, if you have any further questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask them. Feel free to ask them in the chat, either publicly or directly to me. Um, I will give everybody a moment to jump in, and if not, I will take the moderator's prerogative and ask a question of my own. All right, so for organizations who wanna look at, you know, if pay for their existing employees is fair, what resources are there to start gauging that? And how can they begin to remedy any problems that they might find in that surveying? Mary, do you wanna start or do you want me to? You go ahead. Um, I think there are a number of resources out there. Um, I'm thinking of um, a couple from Glassdoor and other, um, and I think GuideStar as well um, that are aggregating data um, and collecting basic information around gender and experience and both experience kind of at the organization and prior experience. Um, but I think as Mary shared, it's actually not super complicated. You just need to, um, first of all, have that data internally and make sure you know which factors you're actually um, looking uh, to compare and, and just look at what it's telling you. And I agree. I think the more that you're sensitive to these issues and really um, holding up that standard, the, the more it will inform how you um, look at your own internal practices. I know in the Reform Pay Equity Initiative, we've had a couple of anecdotal stories that have been really uh, positive changes. For instance, a large congregation um, in America was hiring, uh, just happened to be hiring for two different positions that involve rabbis. And at the end of those processes, they happened to hire one male rabbi, one female rabbi. And the male rabbi went given his compensation offer, um, asked for 10% more. The female rabbi just said, thank you. Because they had been studying pay equity and all the different factors that they uh, were, were able to raise this issue among the, you know, the board and gave both candidates um, a 10% raise on the compensation packages to make sure it would continue to be equitable. Great, thank you. I'm seeing one more question, a more logistical one that has come into um, my chat. Is it possible for us to send out resources to, or many of these resources that you two have mentioned? So yes, folks, we will make sure to include some links to all of this in the webinar follow-up email, along with the recording and these slides. Um, and yeah, from the audience, anyone else, other questions? Um, Morty and Mary, taking the moderator's prerogative again, can you two share a couple other examples of bright spots or really innovative and exciting ways that you've seen organizations make progress on this? Any other standout examples? Well, I'm not gonna name them by, by name, but of our 17 organizations in our, in our initiative, um, through, through our work, there was one that discovered that they had a whole group of um, male employees who had been there for a long time. And as women had integrated the field, um, they had a group of slightly younger women who um, were now there established in their institution. And uh, there was a huge pay gap among the male and female employees. And one of the things that they have been trying to do over multi years, because often, again, with that, that reality of uh, being nonprofit, sometimes uh, fear of scarcity, these changes are not always easy to, to institute overnight. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. through them to bring the women who now had equal responsibility for a number of years mm -hmm. as the male employees and to even everybody out. And it was very, it's been successful. They've been slowly working at it. I think that's amazing. The only thing I'll share is that it feels like the tide is shifting around compensation transparency at the very least. Um, I think we're noticing anecdotally a lot of different organizations posting um, salary ranges in a way that they hadn't before. And just this issue seems to be much more on the radar than it has been in the past, which I think signals that it's becoming part of the ether. Great. I well, would, oh, go I, ahead, Mary. I, I agree. And one of the things I, I do want to say about benefits is uh, at least for, for WRN, we really are trying to um, teach our congregations and institutions that family leave is not a negotiable benefit, but rather it is a foundational benefit and uh, really should not be part of negotiations, in, in meaning well, you'll get family leave or you can have a raise. You can get family leave or you can, can get vacation days. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I think that is the end Almost. of the questions that we've got for right now and also just about the end of our time. So I just want to one more time thank everybody for being here um, and remind you, we do have two more webinars coming up in our webinar series. The next one is same time next week, August 6th. We'll be learning about reporting and response with um, Rahel Bayar. And our last one will be on August 21st. We're going to be learning about education and training what kinds of trainings are out there that you may want to look into for your staff, boards, volunteers, community. Um, so we hope to see many of you online for those. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Zamor to end us with a closing prayer. So we say, may we here today across the Zoom world, re representing our great Jewish community with all of its varied, beautiful facets, understand the virulent inequalities which permeate our community as much as they do secular society. May we be willing to live up to our promise and uphold our best Jewish values to create true safety, true respect, and true equity for all. Let's start by being ethical employers, creating a level playing field for all, fair pay and benefits for all. May we live Deuteronomy's words, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, justice, justice, you shall pursue. <laughs>